Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the circle was red, the study was scarlet, and the scot was glorious, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about the giant rat of Sumatra, the remarkable worm unknown to science, or the repulsive story of the red leech? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode number 221, number 221B, Baker Street. Well, hello and welcome once again to Trifles, the podcast for Sherlock Holmes fans where we talk about the minutia in the stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, I hope you aren't 221 be burnt out. <laughs> no, I'm not, particularly since we installed that asbestos ceiling. I'm I'm in really good shape. <laughs> you have to With wonder. My acetylene torch and... Uh, a, One of the things I like to do is juggle flaming axes in the evening. I just feel much more secure now. That's how I picture you, actually, in your in your uh, smoking jacket. Literally, your smoking Literally, jacket absolutely. and your uh, your fiery axes. Fantastic. Yeah, I always stand with my feet in buckets of water, though. I mean, I, it's not that I ignore safety. No, 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 no. no you're you're a very safe fellow, and well, you know, asbestos. It makes you wonder if uh, if asbestos had been laid out at 221B Baker Street, if it would have subdued the fire uh, that supposedly happened, that Moriarty's associates set fire to Holmes's rooms uh, in the final problem. Uh, maybe oh. maybe there was asbestos laid on, and uh, there wasn't as much damage done because of that. Who knows? Not too many people know that it's a result of that fire in the rooms in Baker Street that Sherlock Holmes later became the inventor of sprinkler systems. <laughs> the Sherlock Holmes brand sprinkler system. Friends, you need... <laughs> Friends, are you accidentally lighting your newspapers on fire? Are you leaving cigarette butt... Uh, cigarette <laughs> burn marks in the... In the f- Oh no! This clearly uh, we're, we're way off, <laughs> way off with no, that. <laughs> no, no. Well, friends, we... you don't have time to deal with the pesky fire brigade every time <laughs> some article of furniture happens to catch fire in your replica Sherlock Holmes room. Now those little balls of flaming coal can just roll out of your fireplace at a, at, at the wrong moment. That's why you need. <laughs> The Sherlock the new Colonel Sebastian Moran sprinkler system. <laughs> One shot, and the fire goes out. <laughs> That's right. Oh boy! <laughs> well, that was fun. Uh, well, uh, this is the part of the episode we are supposed to uh, use to remind you that the show notes are available at ihose.co slash trifles two twenty one all lowercase. That'll take you directly to sherlockholmespodcast dot com to this particular episode. Any links we have. Any additional information you'd like to learn about the show, uh, you can do it there. And if you would like to help us celebrate, now is the time to do that. This is our 221st episode, a remarkable uh, achievement for any podcast, but certainly for a Sherlockian podcast. We actually got to our 221st episode prior to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere getting to its 221st episode. So we're very proud of this. If you'd like to help us celebrate there, why not support us with a Patreon or PayPal donation? For as little as a dollar a month, you can show how you support what we're doing here. Thanks so much, and let's get on with the show. So being the 221st episode, we thought we would do something a little different. We knew we had to celebrate this significant number. So we are diving back into uh, an old piece of scholarship. It is The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, 
by Vincent Sterrett, first written in 1933. It's really a series of essays that he brought together under a single cover. And we have the lovely 75th anniversary edition that was edited by Ray Betzner from our friends at Wessex Press and Gasogene Books. And what we thought we would do is simply to read excerpts from this chapter as a way to honor number 221B. Bert, would you like to kick us off? I would be happy to. Number 221B Baker Street by Vincent Starrett. Once upon a time, but this is not a fairy tale, a group of French schoolboys, for reasons having to do with scholarship or behavior, or, or something of the sort, reached the English capital on a sightseeing tour, asked by the erudite Barker in command of their charabang, what they would like to see first in London, they replied unanimously with a great shout that they would like to see the lodgings of Sherlock Holmes in Baker Street. One hopes the erudite Barker was equal to the occasion. A great many persons have felt that way about the city of London, that Baker Street should come before the Roman wall and the houses of Parliament. After all, there are shrines and shrines, And a great many persons during his lifetime asked Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to identify the house in Baker Street. But that is a point for which excellent reasons, he observes in his autobiography, I will not decide. Has he done so in spite of himself? Like the problem of what songs the sirens sang, And what name Achilles took when he hid himself among women? The question, although puzzling, has not been beyond all conjecture. There is, of course, the address, which is explicitly set forth in the first sentence of the second chapter of A Study in Scarlet. But it is unfortunately misleading, not to say deliberately inaccurate, as tourists have discovered to their great regret. And I would have been, and it would have been impossible, however, for Sir Arthur, or for Watson, so often to have described the famous rooms without betraying some clue to their precise location, and much speculation has been pleasurably wasted upon the mystery. Sherlock Holmes lived on Baker Street, you will recall, hard by what is now Waterloo Station of the Underground in that district of Georgian houses with colorless brick fronts, little windows, iron handrails at the doors, and chimney pots. Thus, Mr. Harry Hansen in the New York world on the occasion of Sir Arthur's death. And Baker Street, he continues, is not very far from Piccadilly, the Strand, Trafalgar Square, and Whitehall, where the trade and politics of the Seven Seas were somehow unraveled and routed throughout the later 19th century. I myself have stood in Baker Street and surveyed a suppositious upper story, wondering whether Sherlock Holmes was standing beside the dark hangings of the windows, looking up and down for a handsome cab with a suspicious driver. I have wondered just how Moriarty went about it to make the place safe, as he called it, and pictured the streets bare of traffic and pedestrians, pervaded with a feeling of imminent danger. Hey, here's a quick question. Did you get a copy of the Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual for 2020? Titled The Unique Hamlet, it was edited by Richard Sveum, and it concerned Vincent Starrett's classic pastiche. Many people are asking about this, and the reviews are spectacular. The only thing is, you can't get a copy. Why? Well, the only way you can get a copy of the Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual every year is if you have an annual subscription. It's now 2021. Isn't it time that you took out a subscription to the Baker Street Journal? Not only will you get the four issues that arrive in the spring, summer, autumn, and winter, but you'll get that fifth Christmas Annual issue as well. It's the only way to get that particular issue with one single topic, edited by some of the best Sherlockians in the world. Don't miss your opportunity to get a copy of the 2021 Christmas Annual from the Baker Street Journal at BakerStreetIrregulars.com today.
But Mr. Hansen was content with the impression, as was the present writer when he roamed the length of Baker Street upon a day in drear November. There was indeed a house at 66, which satisfied one's occult sense of rightness. But the notion that it was the very place that has long since passed in the light of the surprising research of another quester. It required, quite plainly, the genius of another sleuth, gifted, as Holmes himself was gifted, to run its eye along the many pages of the record and find the hidden clue. All other searchers paused and then retired in confusion when Dr. Briggs announced his solution. The clue is in that admirable adventure of the empty house, first of the collection brought together as the return of Sherlock Holmes. One recalls the circumstances of that adventure, growing out of the murder of the Honorable Ronald A. Dare, how, after a circuitous journey through silent, menacing streets, through networks of mews and stables, whose very existence to Watson had been unknown. Holmes passed at length through a wooden gate into a deserted yard and opened the back door of the empty house. The description of the place is definite, almost exact. Dark, as was the house within, Watson followed his companion down the long straight hall until he dimly saw the murky fanlight over the door in front. The window panes were thick with dust. The room was only faintly illumined by the lamplights of the street beyond. And then Holmes's lips were at the doctor's ear. Do you know where we are? He whispered. Surely that is Baker Street, answered the puzzled Watson, staring through the dusty window. Exactly. We are in Camden House, which stands opposite our old quarters. Camden House. Spending a part of his summer vacation in London a few years ago, Dr. Gray Chandler Briggs of St. Louis, the well-known rentgenologist, mapped Baker Street from end to end. A labor of love, he had devoted no little of his medical leisure to a study of the textbooks. One suspects that they were in his trunk and crossed the ocean with him. The return, one fancies, was beneath his arm and his Kodak was in a convenient pocket. As a, result, as a result of his investigations, he photographed the house at 111 and called it that of Sherlock Holmes. No more brilliant identification, one ventures, has been made in our time. Writing of this discovery to Frederick Dor Steele, who's famous of the detective's portraitist, the doctor set forth the minutiae the minutia of his expedition. Like Holmes himself, he had approached the empty dwelling from the rear. He had turned into a narrow alley and passed through a wooden gate and into a yard to find himself at the back door, which had admitted the detective. Looking in, he saw the long, straight hall extending through the house to a front door of solid wood, above which was a fan-shaped transom. Conclusive, all of it, for already over the door in the front, he had read the surviving placard. Camden House. There is only one house on the whole of Baker Street that answers the description, wrote the St. Louis specialist. And when I told Sir Arthur that the sign Camden House was over the door, he was amazed. He told me with such seriousness that I could not doubt him that he did not believe he had ever been in Baker Street in his life. And if he had, it had been many years before so long that he had forgotten. There's something spooky about Doyle anyway, added the doctor to his friend. The deduction that, fo that followed this discovery was obviously elementary. Since Camden House stood opposite the famous lodgings, the rooms of Sherlock Holmes in Baker Street were, of necessity, those upon the second story of the building numbered 111. One wonders if the doctor counted the steps. There were 17, you will recall, leading upward from the lower hall to the collaborator's sitting room. Watson was ragged a bit about them in the opening pages of A Scandal in Bohemia, 
but there was no bay window, noted Dr. Briggs. Watson, to the contrary, notwithstanding. That, he supposed, was one of his confrères little fictions. For every reader, there is, no doubt, a different picture of that famous living room. And probably it is not subject to change. Do you prefer it on a blazing day in August when, quote, Baker Street was like an oven and the glare of the sunlight upon the yellow brickwork of the house across the road was painful to the eye, end quote? A day when, quote, it was hard to believe that these were the same walls which loomed so gloomily through the fogs of winter, end quote. On one such day, at least, with all the blinds half drawn, Holmes lay upon the sofa and read a letter that he had received by the morning post, which was to call him to the adventure of the cardboard box. But Watson's term of service in India, he tells us, had trained him to stand the heat better than the cold. A thermometer at 90 was no hardship for the veteran Watson. Or do you like an evening of late September, when the equinoctial gales were raging with exceptional violence? Such days and nights brought tragic cases to the sitting room of Baker Street. What a picture, for instance, is recorded by Watson in those early pages of the Five Orange Pips. Quote, All day the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against the windows, so that even here, here in the heart of a great handmade London, we were forced to raise our hands for the instant from the routine of life and to recognize the presence of those great elemental forces which shriek at mankind through the bars of his civilization, like untamed beasts in a cage. As evening drew in, the storm grew louder and louder, and the wind cried and sobbed like a child in the chimney. Sherlock Holmes sat moodily on one side of the fireplace, cross-indexing his records of crime, whilst I at the other was deep in one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories, until a howl of the gale from without seemed to blend with the text and the splash of the rain to lengthen out the long swash of the sea waves. And then the bell inevitably the bell. Looking from the window on such a night which was a habit with both Holmes and Watson, one might have seen the occasional lamps gleaming on the expanse of muddy road and shining pavement, and perhaps a single cab splashing its way from the Oxford Street end to deposit Inspector Stanley Hopkins on the detective's doorstep. And not always on such tempestuous evenings did Holmes attack his files with moody industry, nor Watson lose himself at sea. There were times when they sat together in busy silence all the evening, the detective perhaps engaged with a powerful lens, deciphering the remains of the original inscription upon a palimpsest, said Watson, deep in a recent treatise upon surgery. Sooner or later, however, they were called away. It is at least astonishing the number of cases that came to Holmes and Watson in inclement season, dragging them from their comfortable hearth to brave the rigors of indecent English weather. Or will you have a cold morning in the early spring, with thick fog rolling down between the lines of dun-colored houses, and the opposing windows looming like dark, shapeless blurs through the heavy yellow wreaths. The gas is lighted and shines upon the white tablecloth and upon the glimmer of china and metal and upon Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson at breakfast on either side of a cheery fire in the old room in Baker Street, emerging from a cloud of newspapers in which he has been reading the agony columns the detective lights his long cherrywood pipe with a glowing cinder lifted from the coals and lectures Watson upon the sensationalism of his records. Not that they always breakfasted together. A schedule of their appearances at table would be, inval- would be valuable and interesting, but unfortunately impossible. It all depended. That Holmes rose late we have been several times assured save, to be sure, on those occasions when he was up all night. Yet there were times when Watson breakfasted after Holmes. The record is surprisingly confused, and the only possible inference is, as Father Knox points out, that Watson breakfasted very late indeed. 
His own assertion that he was regular in his habits has little bearing on the matter. He may have risen at noon and still have been quite regular. Certain it is that he resented early calls. Holmes, to the contrary, took what sleep he could and occasionally stayed in bed for several days. But one likes to find them breakfasting together and wishes that it might have happened oftener. Rashes of bacon seem to have been a staple, with sometimes eggs and always toast and coffee. Well, we're going to have to end the essay here. We will be back next week with part two of number 221B by Vincent Sterrett. It's just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Found. At the corner of Good Street, a goose and a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Baker can have same by applying at 6.30 this evening at 221B Baker Street. Clear and concise.